Mao's spies had stumbled onto one of the biggest secrets of World War II, but they simply were not believed because they were Chinese. Meanwhile, both Chang and Mao found it mutually beneficial to begin spying not just in the Japanese, but on each other as well. The head of Chang's intelligence network was an elusive figure whose brutal reputation still elicits fear in China today. His name was Dai Li, a major general in Chang's Kuomintang party. He headed an organization with the innocuous name of Bureau of Statistics and Investigation. Dai Li's intelligence force was at the time the largest in the world. The estimates of the number of assets or agents ranged from 100,000 to 300,000 agents. He had agents uh, throughout China, in Japan, throughout uh, Southeast Asia, in the South Pacific, and even in America. He was a brilliant man, he was a tough-minded general, but he also he was a cutthroat. Precisely because of the image of being a cutthroat, efficient military chief, he attracted both admirations as well as hostility. He was ultra-loyal to Jiang Kai-shek, so he hated the communists, and the communists, of course, hated him. Interestingly enough, Dai Li's crack agents ran up against the same prejudice that Mao's spies had earlier. Despite their proven ability, their own allies did not take them seriously. The crypto analysts that worked for Dai Li managed to crack the Japanese military codes and twice provided the United States with advance warning of the Pearl Harbor attack, warning that was ignored by the, the War Department, partly on the supposition that the Chinese couldn't possibly have carried out this cryptoanalytic feat. The situation in China was about to change. The Japanese, unable to wipe out the resistance in China, turned their sights on the Pacific. Despite the warnings of Dai Li's codebreakers, the Americans were not prepared when Japan attacked the naval fleet at Pearl Harbor. A new player was about to enter the already confused field of wartime China. And Mao Zedong was about to acquire his strangest ally. The Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor brought the United States into World War II. But Pearl Harbor had immense ramifications for China as well. I ask that the Congress declare a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. China had now become America's partner in the war. Despite China's united front with Mao's communists, the United States only recognized the government of Chiang Kai-shek. The Americans began a massive campaign to support Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists, not only with troops, but with money, equipment, and arms as well. The Americans rapidly concluded that every Japanese soldier tied down fighting in China was a Japanese soldier who wouldn't be fighting in the Philippines or Hawaii or in San Diego. So the American priority was keeping China in the war. Everyone recognized its efficiency was low, its success rate minimal, but as long as China stayed in the war, it tied down Japan. The Japanese controlled all of the Western Pacific, preventing any aid to China by sea. So the Allies came the other way, sending supplies to India, which were then flown 500 miles over the Himalayas on a brutal mission known as Flying the Hump. In exchange for arms and equipment, the United States needed one thing from China, information. China was to become America's listening post. 
With this in mind, U.S. naval intelligence contacted the most knowledgeable man in Asia, the nationalist spymaster Dai Li. Lieutenant Commander Milton Miles of the U.S. Navy became the point man in a joint operation with the nationalist intelligence men called Naval Group China. This once classified film, shot by U.S. intelligence operatives, is one of the few times the elusive Dai Li allowed himself to be filmed. The Special Forces trained by Naval Group China in 1942-43 in cooperation with Dai Li were designed to achieve several goals. Some were to be guerrillas in demolition, blow up bridges, blow up tunnels, harass the Japanese. Some were to be weather groups to set up uh, weather tracking stations in North China and Manchuria. Other groups were designed to root out Japanese collaborators in unoccupied China. Their espionage methods ranged from the highly technical, like code breaking, to the most simple, such as the use of carrier pigeons for covert long distance communication. Commander Miles set up headquarters on a hill overlooking Chiang Kai shek's capital of Chongqing. Though many Americans felt the real war was in Europe, Lieutenant Commander Miles saw China as the ideal place for his military career. Miles saw this, like many other people, as his stake, that if he could develop a relationship with Dai Li and Chiang Kai-shek, it would, it would be a personal it would be a personal fiefdom for himself, as well as give the U.S. Navy operational opportunities in China. Dai Li and the Chinese nationalists had their own ulterior motives in the exchange. Chinese nationalist leadership, especially Zhang and Dai Li, saw Naval Group China as a sort of backdoor to Washington, a way to curry influence, a way to get supplies, and a way to run around groups they didn't like. But soon, another group of spies would enter the picture. General William Wild Bill Donovan had just created the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, a forerunner of the CIA. Its creation in 1941 was controversial. U.S. Army and Navy intelligence resented yet another spy agency meddling in military matters, especially with a civilian at the helm. Though the OSS had many successful operations in the European theater, it was also in Europe that Donovan faced the most resistance from rival Allied intelligence groups. Donovan looked for an arena where he could operate without interference. He thought he'd found it in China. Donovan wanted the one thing in the China theater more than anything else, the independence with which he could operate his intelligence operations. And that potential of being independent from the army control, from the Chinese control, really was most delicious to him. And he spent a lot of energy and time resources in the China theater. Donovan loosely allied his organization with the Chinese-American joint operation. The OSS brought experience and resources to China that Milton Miles' naval intelligence did not have. The morale operation, fake rumors, make up stories, and they print fake documents to destabilize enemies' will to fight. For example, they will say the emperor had criticized the occupation forces in China for their atrocities, which of course is a fake story. And they even made up story to say General Tojo and Hitler have some kind of homosexual relationships. The arrival of Donovan and the OSS alarmed many of the Americans in China. Milton Miles, now a captain, saw Donovan as encroaching on his turf. Donovan, for his part, chafed under the command of Miles and naval intelligence. Donovan looked for an alliance that would give his spies free reign. 
he soon turned his eyes northward to the other center of Japanese resistance, Mao's communists. Mao's troops had already built a reputation as fearless guerrillas. Little was known about Mao's intelligence operations, but they were rumored to be reliable. The fact that the communists were isolated geographically and militarily was not lost on William Donovan, who saw an opportunity for real independence. In December 1943, Donovan sent a discreet message to Mao in his headquarters in Yan'an, signaling that he might want to meet. Little did Donovan know that his OSS operation had already been penetrated by Mao's spies. The deputy director had this romantic obsession with his secretary, and he could not do it in downtown Chongqing. So, and he seeked the help of one of the guys who he knew who spoke English very well. So this guy arranged a serene house in a suburb so he could have some kind of dalliances with his secretary. And uh, in return, he was very grateful to this person. And this person happened to be Yan Baohang and the top spy of the Chinese communist. Unaware that the communist Yan Baohong had already infiltrated OSS operations, Donovan sent word to Mao of a possible alliance. Mao was intrigued. Overt American aid was possibly his best chance at gaining legitimacy and support. He sent word back the Chinese Communist Party would be quite happy to become America's ally. Under Donovan's direction, a unique team of American spies and diplomats quietly prepared to travel north to meet Mao Zedong. It was 1944, and in China, the Allies were not finding the support they so desperately needed. Despite millions of dollars and thousands of tons of arms and ammunition, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist forces were unable to make any headway against the Japanese. American General Albert Wiedemeyer, head of the Army's headquarters in China, could only express disgust at the military state of America's supposed ally. He said, China's army is ready for a general hospital rather than a general reserve. The disorganization and muddled planning of the Chinese is beyond comprehension. Part of the problem was that Chiang Kai-shek refused to use all his new allied resources against the Japanese, preferring instead to save his best troops and equipment to fight against Mao once the war with Japan was over. In the nationalists' eyes, the real war was still against the communists. In 1943 and early 1944, the military situation in China was so bleak with the Chinese nationalist armies failing to fight effectively, squandering aid, squirreling it away for an expected civil war, that Roosevelt became intrigued by the advice of some embassy staffers that there was more than one horse to back in China. There was another horse, and that horse might be the Chinese Communist movement. With a little aid, with a little encouragement, they could be induced to fight the Japanese more effectively. William Donovan, head of the OSS, had come to the same conclusion. He began to put together a secret task force. Its goals were to coordinate guerrilla missions, investigate the communist operations, train Chinese operatives, and relay all significant information back to Washington. Calling itself the Dixie Mission, the group began to make its way to Yan'an. Mao's communist stronghold in northwest China. The Dixie mission consisted of two dozen men. Some were OSS trainers and staff. The rest were members of the U.S. Foreign Service. Diplomats, not soldiers, most of them young, many of them fluent in Chinese. 
Their arrival in Yan'an was captured in this once top secret OSS film. It was a diplomatic victory for the communists. Mao was very receptive to the Dixie mission. He gave them the nicest caves in Yan'an. People lived in caves carved out of sandstone. He invited them to dances. In fact, the half dozen or so American political officers in the Dixie mission probably spent more time with Mao and his close aides than any other foreigners did uh, in the 1930s, 40s, or 50s. Colonel David Barrett arrived with the Dixie Mission in June 1944. He found a hardened group of guerrillas who were adept at conducting operations behind enemy lines. Soon, shipments of weapons and explosives once meant for the nationalists were rerouted to the communists in Yan'an. The communists found the OSS equally useful. What the Chinese Communists wanted from the OSS were three things. Cash, with which to bribe the puppets for weapons. Secondly, the Communists wanted arms equipment. And thirdly, I think it's most importantly, that the Chinese Communists wanted from the OSS an open military and intelligence cooperation. The openness of that would signal the American acquiescence of the political legitimacy of Chinese Communist government. The leading member of the mission's diplomatic corps was John Service, who saw in Yunnan the future of free China. Jack Service, as he was known to his friends, had been born in China. He was a missionary kid. He had superb Chinese, not just regular Mandarin Chinese, but also knew many dialects, and uh, was one of those um, inquisitive, all-American heroes who was able to move through the back alleys of cities and, and villages and pick up immense amounts of information. He became convinced during the Dixie Mission that the communists were China's best hope. 